Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the November, December 2023 meeting of the Oregon Archaeological Society. Tonight's speaker is Mark Willis. Mark is the preeminent archaeological photographer working today, pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, Mark has invented several methods of photographing archaeological sites in various ways. And these, he puts a camera on a big tall pole and takes a million pictures and makes you a, a photogrammetric map of the site. He, he photographs from uh, drones. That's what we did there at, at Riding on Stone. He does LIDAR mapping. And, and that's only to skim the surface. He does lots and lots and lots of stuff there. He's worked around the world, literally around the world, most recently in several countries in Mesoamerica, in the, in the South Sea Islands, and in the French Paleolithic Caves. As I mentioned, he's also worked with the OAS Rock Art Research Group uh, this summer, this spring, at the Visotsky site in northwestern Montana, and a couple of three years ago at uh, the No Bear site on the Blackfeet Reservation and at Writing on Stone. So uh, tonight's presentation, Mark is going to talk about technology and archaeology, innovations in recording rock art and other archaeological phenomena from around the world. Take it away, Mark. All right. Is that shared? Looks like it's showing up there. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, so I have this scheduled when I ran through it earlier. It took about an hour. Um, if I have less time than that, let me know and I'll I'll shorten it up where I need to. So uh, Jim, appreciate uh, uh, welcoming me in. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of the knowledge I've got with you on, on technology and archeology. span uh, and as Jim mentioned, um, a lot of what I do is help other archaeologists with certain tasks that they're trying to accomplish. So I'm normally the et al. on the end of a, a paper or a, a book because uh, I'm the, the guy that was there helping the, the people that do the real hard work uh, like Jim and, and Dave. So I'll get started. Uh, these are the topics that we're going to go over um, this evening. I'm going to put most of the emphasis on photogrammetry because that's a technology that all of us can can use and it's uh, so super helpful. Um, we'll talk about structured light scanning a little bit, uh, traditional laser scanning, and we'll touch briefly on virtual reality and 3D printing. And then uh, we'll go heavy into drones towards uh, the end. So um, one thing when I, when I give these talks, I noticed um, a few months ago that I was spending all my time just focused on talking about the, you know, the, the petroglyph panel or, you know, so focused on the technology that I wasn't stopping and kind of showing people the, the kinds of places that uh, I get to work. And uh, some of them I think will be familiar to you. So I'm going to go through just a few photos. Um, no technology, just kind of give you uh, an idea of some of the places I get to work. And uh, I promise I, I won't go too far into the vacation photos. Um, this is a site that I did some uh, 3D analysis for the National Park Service at the Alabates uh, Flint Quarry, which is in uh, the northern part of Texas. Uh, this is a site that got me into archaeology when I was young, uh, going around and uh, finding Flint nodules and things. It was uh, kind of what sparked my interest. But, uh, completely different site. This one's located uh, in West Texas in the middle of the desert, and it's a natural spring that has some beautiful petroglyphs. I'm sorry, uh, pictographs you can't quite see, but uh, the, the setting is, is quite amazing. Uh, another little bit of variety. Um, this is... Uh, uh, Bilbo, one of the archaeologists, has worked in the southern New Mexico area forever. And this is a site that's high up in the mountains overlooking the desert, uh, almost in Mexico, uh, in southern New Mexico. 
and it's called uh, Lion's Den. We did a lot of 3D mapping in here recently. Um, and not all sites uh, need to have a whole lot of technology thrown at them. Uh, this is a site called Cerro Chino, which uh, is uh, on the edge of Big Bend National Park. And uh, in this case, uh, doing uh, just traditional going out at night and photographing and handing a, a light at, at different angles was allow us, allowed us to see some pretty amazing uh, petroglyphs there. Jim, I think, mentioned that uh, I put cameras on poles. I think that's probably one of the things I'm most well known for. But this is the only pole photograph I'll subject you to during this talk. Uh, this is a site called the Graph Site, and I, I hope uh, you can see many of the petroglyphs uh, that are below uh, being taken from the, the camera here. Uh, very similar to Lewis Canyon, if any of you visited that site uh, down near Del Rio, where Schumann does a lot of work. Now we jump over to a totally different part of the world. Um, this is a uh, cave, uh, the Chauvet Cave, and this is a, a bare skull on an altar-like rock. Uh, one of the most amazing places I ever had a chance to work. Um, just uh, changes your whole view of the world when you get to see some of these virtually untouched uh, sites in Europe. Um, you learn, uh, working in Europe, especially in caves, that you start squeezing yourself into places you never thought you would ever squeeze uh, yourself into. So there's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, this is just a, a bison hidden back in a very small grotto I had to squeeze into to look at. And this is uh, one of my colleagues, Carol Fritz, and uh, me, the bald guy there, working in the site of Marsoulis. Uh, this site is where I learned a lot about doing very challenging photography. Um, it's a very dark environment. You can't touch the walls. You have to be very, very careful. And it takes two people working in very close quarters to, to do the documentation. Uh, this is a site I did some pole mapping with in, in uh, far western Wyoming. Julie Francis, if any of y'all know her. Um, and just another side, just showing another setting in the desert. This is my friend Juan Arias. There's a ton of pictographs uh, back behind him. You can't quite see. And finally, uh, this is my friend, uh, some of you probably know, Larry Lowendorf. And I tried to figure out how we're going to photograph this uh, pictograph panel that's about six inches off the ground and uh, get it all adequately uh, mapped in. And, and we did. So that's just, those are my vacation photos. I'll, I'll leave that there and we can uh, jump into uh, the more meat of the talk. Like I said, I'm going to focus on photogrammetry mostly here. Um, you'll hear the term SFM and photogrammetry kind of intermixed. And uh, SFM stands for structure from motion. Um, that is a, a term that was developed in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, and had to do with the science of, of um, motion pictures that was just starting then, and how the mind could, could comprehend a 3D object from a 2D uh, picture, yeah, you know, motion picture. And that term is what somehow ended up being stuck with photogrammetry because we're using some of the same concepts of figuring out the 3D shape of things uh, by using the motion of a camera, moving it to different spots and, and figuring out what's there. So uh, in this uh, instance, the train, uh, that's uh, where the first use of structure for motion came from, is that the human mind, even looking at a flat 2D image of a train, can comprehend that the front of the train is closer to you and would be moving that direction. So. Just a little bit of background on that term, if you've ever ever wondered. Um, so, I probably should have added a, a cell phone to this uh, image here, but um, all you need to do photogrammetry is a, a either a traditional camera like we used to use with film or uh, a digital camera. Uh, 
digital cameras, just because you can take so many photos and process them for free <clears throat> is really the way everyone's going these days. But knowing that traditional photos work uh, can be very uh, beneficial. And I'll show you a couple examples of that here in a little bit. So uh, the way photogrammetry works is you need a series of overlapping images. You need at least three images that overlap <clears throat> from different angles to be able to create a 3D image of what you're interested in. So here, this is the uh, Myers Springs uh, pictograph site. Um, and uh, it's a very crude example kind of showing you where three photos were taken so that I could create a 3D model of what was in the middle. Uh, and the reason you want to do photogrammetry on archaeological sites is you get a snapshot of what that site is like at that moment. Um, it is worth pointing out and, and reminding people that cameras are amazing these days, but your human eye is still better. So uh, we haven't got to the point where we're completely uh, replacing the human eye or, or completely recreating these, these sites uh, where um, there is still some value in going to them in person. But uh, as you know, many of, especially with rock art sites, many of the sites have been vandalized, either painted on or shot with a gun and, and they're, they're disappearing pretty quickly. So the, the more of us that, that take these multiple overlapping photos, the, the more there's gonna be for people to look at in the future that can't see the real thing. Um, each of um, these blue symbols you see here represents a camera. Uh, where a photograph was taken. And so this is just kind of showing a quick example of all of these uh, dozens of photographs that were taken from different angles uh, to create this um, 3D model. So uh, the software is able to triangulate based on multiple overlapping photos what the surface of the subject is and then create a 3D model from that point cloud. I was looking at this earlier and I noticed this is the last of us uh, graphic novel, if any of you watched the, the movie, but I hadn't noticed that was there. Um, so uh, there's some kind of rules of thumb that you can find this graphic on the internet. Um, number one, if you're gonna do photogrammetry, um, take a lot of photos. If you think you've taken a lot of photos, take a lot more because you almost, uh, always won't have with the parts that you thought you did. So uh, with today, with digital photography, photos are virtually free. So um, it, you can always delete pictures, but the more you have, the more chance you have of success. Um, you want to move around as much as possible, taking photos from different angles, as opposed to uh, being in one spot when you take the pictures. But uh, that said, uh, the modern photogrammetry uh, software is amazing and it's incredibly forgiving. Uh, so if, you know, whatever photographs you can get is very likely you'll be able to get a good 3D model out of them. Um, so there, is, there are some costs involved at some level. Um, and, uh, you know, you get what you pay for as usual. Uh, the software uh, that I prefer to use is called Metashape. Uh, it was called PhotoScan for a long time. Uh, there's an educational version that sells for $50. Uh, and then uh, the regular license sells for about $300. And then there's a pro version if you're doing some really fancy stuff that most people don't need to do. That It's quite a bit more expensive than that. Um, Reality Capture is a software that was recently purchased by... Uh, company called Unreal that does a lot of video game work and they've been innovating this software quite a lot. Uh, so it's getting pretty robust. Uh, it's a subscription based uh, software, which I don't like myself, but some people uh, don't have a problem with that. Uh, and then there are several apps uh, and these change all the time, but uh, these are some of the more stable apps that have been around for a while that work on iPhone and Android. Uh, one of the best, uh, especially for iPhone, is called Polycam, and that gives you 180 free scans. Uh, I don't know how much it costs after that, but um, 
most people I know haven't done the 180 scans that would uh, use up their free uh, scans when they've been just trying to learn. Um, the other is this Scaniverse, um, which is another great one for iPhone, also works on, uh, I'm sorry, it only works on iPhone. And then um, lastly is, is Carry Engine, which is uh, has a free version. And then there's, if you want to do some fancy stuff, you can add uh, a pay version on that. So those are kind of the softwares that, that are out there. If you want to learn photogrammetry, the best thing I can recommend is get one of the free apps for your phone and just go find something you want to make a 3D model of, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a lamp or something in your house and take some pictures and you'll be surprised how easy it is. And then you'll know how to do it when you're on an archeological site. Um, so uh, I'm gonna walk you through a couple examples and then we'll, we'll, we'll diverge out a little bit. Um, here is a quick 3D model I made at a site uh, at a panel at Waco Tanks, which is a, a amazing uh, site with rock art on the far western part of Texas. Uh, there are about 20 photos. Again, there are these blue images here. And from that, I was able to create this image we have in the background. And that is not a photograph, if you're unfamiliar with this sort of data, it's actually a, a 3D model. And there it is with the, the photos turned off. Uh, this is in the software, so you can see this uh, sphere. You can see some pictographs down here on the bottom. Uh, but one of the neat things you're able to do is turn off the texture. And when you remove the texture, you can often you can see the shape of the rock better. Uh, this works great with petroglyphs because the, the images will stand out. Um, it also sometimes will help you understand uh, why a piece of rock art was put there. Uh, oftentimes, there'll be some sort of natural cleft in the rock or shape that finishes the part of an animal or is a place where a bunch of animals are jumping into a crack, um, that sort of thing. So th this kind of monochrome image can be uh, useful for understanding rock art. And uh, this image looks very similar to a couple of the earlier ones, except this one has all of the texture information from the cameras reprojected back onto the 3D model. And finally, uh, just like you can with photos, you can de-stretch these images um, to bring out uh, some amazing details. Uh, often you'll get better results just de-stretching uh, de individual images as opposed to the 3D model, but sometimes you'll see new things. But I think you can see a cloud terrace here, uh, some other images in red. And <clears throat> I'm sure 99% of you all uh, that are listening already know all about John Harmon's uh, de-stretch app. But in case somebody's watching this on the internet uh, and stumbles across this video, uh, this app is amazing. Um, it allows you to see uh, all sorts of things you can't see with your naked eye. I believe it was between 20 and $30. It's been a while since I purchased it. Um, by far the most expensive app I've ever bought, but uh, worth every penny. Uh, and here's just a quick example. Uh, this is, I've got the app open on my phone and I'm taking a picture of my phone with the rock art in the background showing you how you can pull out uh, these details, uh, which, which match uh, kind of meta, I suppose. But anyway, if you don't know about D-Stretch, you're uh, missing out. Um, I'm gonna walk through a couple of petroglyph examples next. Um, in this example, um, again, the blue represent photographs and we're looking at a point cloud, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet. But uh, this, this shows there's 42 photos make up this uh, model that I was working on. Yeah, this is a uh, horizontal uh, petroglyph uh, at the side of a bow. Um, here it is with the uh, texture turned off. You can see the shape of the rock a little bit. You'll see this kind of fuzzy looking hairy stuff uh, around some of the edges. Uh, that is grass or other plant material that's growing up. Um, photogrammetry does not do well with organics like 
living plants. It, it, they're so complicated that it, it gets confused. It'll make this kind of fuzzy mess. Um, and here is one of the videos. Hopefully it's going to play okay. I might play it twice just to show it to you, but it gives you an idea of the 3D nature of what um, these models are like. And this is using an, an enhancement to make uh, details stand out a little bit better uh, on the rock. Okay, let's see. I'm going to let it go one more time just in case it was uh, too jittery. Just get another chance to see it. And this is the most complicated video I've got. The next one is much simpler. So uh, if you're not able to see this, don't worry about it. Zoom does strange things sometimes when you're trying to play videos. Okay. So uh, here's an animated GIF showing some of the other enhancements that we can do. Um, and this is using... Uh, basically enhancements that were designed to bring out details in 3D models for video games. Uh, and so I've just taken their technology that they're using to try to get the most bang for their buck in a video game to bring out details in, in our models. Um, so that's hopefully a good example of that. Um, there are a couple different enhancement techniques. Um, I'm gonna show you one more. Um, and this is another horizontal um, petroglyph site. Uh, this is on Fort Bliss in southern New Mexico. And um, so this is a limestone piece of bedrock. Uh, we've trimmed back the plants a little bit. Uh, it's You can probably barely make it out, but there's some almost like horn-like things here. There's some eyes here and kind of the round shape of a face. Um, when we first visited this site, it was... Uh, just a little bit after sunrise and it was very good striking light and we were able to see some of these petroglyphs a little better than you can see uh, in this light. Um, but just as before, um, we took and created, uh, you know, did photogrammetry, took, I, I'm just guessing, probably a couple hundred photographs uh, facing down after we trimmed back some of the vegetation. You might notice that some of the dirt from the vegetation actually makes it hard to see the panel, uh, but it, we're able to get past that uh, when we do the 3D modeling. So this is uh, something called an X shade enhancement, and it's still very faint. And you got to realize that this petroglyph is probably microns thick in places, and so it's just very, very ephemeral. Um, here are those horn-like things, almost like a jester's hat looking. Uh, thing, uh, probably related to sheep, I would suspect. Uh, the eyes, uh, there's a mouth here, a nose, a chin, I suppose, or some sort of painting round out of the face. Uh, then if you look closely, there's a line that comes here, goes up here. And this is kind of hard to see, but I'm pretty sure it's a bighorn sheep uh, that's somehow associated with this, this figure. So we're able to pull out all sorts of, of things using these different enhancements. Uh, and oftentimes uh, there are things you can hardly see at all with your naked eye, if at all. Um, the, I, I don't have time to go into this uh, in any kind of detail because it's, it's pretty complicated, but we're also able to, uh, by working with artists, uh, which I highly recommend uh, as opposed to just doing photography, um, we can take the artist renderings and transfer uh, the modern artist renderings and transfer them back onto the rock art so we can get an idea of what it might have looked like uh, when it was in better condition or more easy to see. Uh, this is an example from Marsoulis in uh, southern France, the Pyrenees. And uh, this is uh, Gilles Tussello, uh and my work um, as a lot going on here, bison, you know, just all sorts of crazy stuff. But uh, we're able to take his uh, amazing renderings and put them back into the 3D model and then spin it around and look at it in, in 3D. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
So it's not only um, rock art and such that photogrammetry is good for. You, you can use it actually for all sorts of stuff, but uh, excavations is a really good uh, thing. Uh, this is a site uh, friends of mine were digging and they asked, hey, could you make a quick 3D model? Uh, if I remember correctly, I did this one with my phone. Uh, this is a pit house here. Uh, once it's made into a 3D model, and you have any sort of place where there's a scale where you can see these one meter units, you can tell the computer what that scale is, and then you can do all sorts, you can calculate volumes, you can uh, measure things. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, so I guess I kind of answered my own question there. <laughs> so it is really cool, um, but how useful is it? And I'm going to show you a few examples of, of ways it can be useful that you may not have thought of uh, before. So um, one of the great things about this is it doesn't, you don't have to use photos that you took recently. You can use old photos. You can use very old photos. Um, and this is an example of an area where I took some photos in 2003, you can see down in the lower right, in 2011 of the same site. And uh, an amazing thing that photogrammetry can do that's virtually impossible to do any other way is it can very precisely align two photos taken from different, uh, slightly different angles and, and line them up perfectly. So uh, in this case, we can see that just from 2003 to 2011, this piece of this uh, Pecos River style figure has broken off. There's numerous little places that have popped off. Um, I've been back to this site more recently and I'll probably go back uh, hopefully this month to try to get a 20 year reunion of, of what the panel looks like. Uh, but to my eye, this is really rapid deterioration when you consider how old this, this thing is. Uh, this is another example. Uh, it's called, uh, this figure is called the, the White Horn Dancer. It's from Waco Tanks. The more white photo is, I believe, one of Kirkland's early photographs of the site. And then the more grainy one is actually from a, a newspaper article. And uh, I was able to uh, from the 1970s and was able to reproject and connect these. Um, just showing you that you can use images from a pretty wide variety of formats. Uh, you can see there's been some breakage up here in the upper right. There's some other little things going on. That's some of the paint here on the arm looks like this area popped off. Just a really good way of understanding what's happening to a, a panel over time. Uh, this one I'll just touch on briefly. Uh, this one, uh, on one of the archaeological email listservs I'm on, somebody posted a picture, uh, which is this recent image <clears throat> that you see in the lower right, and they said, somebody's been out there shooting up the, the petroglyphs. Um, and so I looked on the internet, found an image that was about 20 years old, used photogrammetry to align those two, and then these hot marks you see um, are, in fact, uh, from bullets, but uh, they're not recent. And in fact, I would ex suspect that they're actually probably quite old. Um, so just, just another example, what you can do with, with photogrammetry. Um, we'll change gears and focus on a couple of other technologies. Um, structured light scanning. Um, one of the interesting things about this technology is how quickly it can scan artifacts. So this is a plastic device you hold in your hand, uh, weighs maybe a pound and a half, and it has a, a number of cameras and light emitters that are on it. And it projects uh, a couple of different designs of light onto the uh, subject matter. And using different cameras, it's able to look at that design and discern a 3D shape. So. Um, it does kind of the same thing photogrammetry does. It does it faster and uh, it's really pretty slick. But uh, the downside, of course, is um, this particular unit is uh, when I got mine about a year ago, it was, I think, around $25,000 and maybe $28,000. I think now it's already the cost of it's dropped down to $24,000. 
dollars. So very expensive. But what's happening with photogrammetry and these other technologies is it's forcing these more expensive technologies to come down in price and to become more user friendly. Um, the reason I purchased this device was because I had a, a project uh, scanning a bunch of uh, burial items, several hundred burial items, and it was going to be cost effective and time effective to, to use the device to, to do the scanning. Uh, again, really briefly on uh, virtual reality, you know, virtual reality has been around a while now. Uh, it's normally pretty overhyped, uh, but it can be quite powerful. Um, this is from some work I did in Australia. The, uh, this device, you can, I'm not sure if you can still buy it at Walmart, but you buy them at Walmart or Best Buy, and they're really just kind of a $10 housing that you slide a, a a smartphone into and using an app, it turns that uh, smartphone with a little enclosure into a virtual reality app. So it's very, very inexpensive. Uh, and almost everywhere you go these days, people have smartphones uh, just <laughs> pretty much everywhere. So um, we were able to show some of the data we were working on, rock art panels to some of the kids who just absolutely loved it. And some of the elders who weren't quite uh, firm enough to get up to some of the panels they used to go to were able to have a, a virtual experience of what uh, the panels look like today. Um, <clears throat> all of these technologies um, need a way to be shown to people. And that had been a problem with the technologies for a while. Uh, but now there are a couple of websites. Uh, the one that I use the most is called sketchfab.com. It's really interesting, even if you're not going to make a 3D model to go check out the site. Uh, it's got a lot of amazing things. Uh, some archaeology and a lot um, that is uh, outside of archaeology. But what it allows you to do is uh, I can make a 3D model, upload it, and then anybody that can operate an iPhone or an Android device, a tablet, can intuitively explore these data. So if you have a touch screen, you just pinch and turn and twist, and you can look at all these items from different levels. It also allows you to uh, view them in virtual reality and that sort of thing. And uh, the website's free. It's uh, pretty interesting. If you want to see any of my models, you can just search um, my first initial M and then Willis, and you can check them out. But there's lots of cool stuff. Um, Here's one of the 3D models that, that's on there. Uh, it's a, a figure emerging from a, a shell uh, Maya figure. We'll, I'll be showing you a little bit more of that in just a, a second. Laser scanning, I'm just going to touch on because of what's happening with the, the cost of laser scanning. Um, this is my colleague, Chet Walker. Uh, he and I got a project from the Department of Defense to map some World War II structures on uh, Wake Island, which is in the middle of the Pacific, like literally the middle of the Pacific. Um, and uh, we used this laser scanner at the time. It was a, uh, this just a few years ago, it was a $120,000 Leica unit. Uh, did amazing things. As you might expect, it, it spins around and projects a laser and creates a a 3D point cloud from that data. Uh, really good if you're doing terrestrial mapping. But <clears throat> here is, uh, this is from just before the pandemic. Uh, I did a whole lot of stuff uh, the several months before the pandemic hit. And you're going to see some images where I'll, I'll keep mentioning that. But um, this is another Leica scanner of, that uh, is now available. Um, at the time we did this work, this scanner was sixteen thousand uh, dollars, so the the price is dropping pretty dramatically. Uh, the size has dropped, so this is something you can put into a backpack and drag into a cave, as we were doing here. Um, it's operated by an iPad uh, or a similar device, and you can see the scan live while you're in the in the field. Um, so really pretty cool stuff. Uh, one of the uh, Total sidebar, but this blew me away. Um, one of the places we were, uh, well, many of the caves we were working in in uh, 
the Philippines, uh, this is in northern Luzon, um, had graffiti all over the entrances. And while we were looking at the live view of the laser scan, while we we're you know in the cave, we noticed uh, several of these lines showing up, these figures, and these are prehistoric pictographs that have been painted over. And in the most case, you wouldn't even see any of them. They're either completely painted over or they're so uh, scraped and such, you wouldn't see them. But the reflectance value from the, la uh, from the laser on the scanner basically saw through the paint and showed us these pictographs. So that was super exciting, neat little thing we, we learned and did a paper about recently. Um, another just brief mention uh, for technologies here. So I'm sure you all are familiar with the Star Trek like, you know, 3D printing that's out. Um, I will say that these have gotten very, very user friendly and they have gotten very inexpensive. Uh, you can buy a very good uh, 3D printer for under $300 and there are many, many of them. There's so many manufacturers, it's crazy. Um, now, what are these useful for archeology? span um, To me, kind of marginally so. Uh, on the left is a projectile point, and on the right is a, I made a 3D model of the projectile point and then printed it out. This is something that if you wanted to be able to share a physical object with somebody to have them check it out as opposed to a virtual object, Again, not sure that's super helpful, but could be, I suppose. And uh, this is a petroglyph panel um, that I believe I sent Jim a, a copy of this one. But um, so you're able to create things like this, so you can look at you can look and hold uh, an object and look at it in a way that you can't, you know, on a computer screen. But um, by far the best use of 3D printing uh, in my experiences have been on a project I did uh, with the University of New Hampshire uh, at Crooked Tree, which is a Creole village in uh, kind of north central Belize. And I'll be showing you a lot of things from Belize. Um, at this particular site, people have, had been coming since the sometime in the 1800s up until, you know, almost yesterday, um, coming to the site, there's a lot of Maya sites. There's also a lot of Creole history in the area. And people have been finding all these amazing artifacts and then taking them off to museums scattered all around. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, the University of Hampshire put together a project and we went to all these museums where these artifacts had been taken to which again, we're all over. Uh, and we created 3D models of the artifacts, printed them out, and then uh, they had built a small little one room museum in their town. And we were able to kind of virtually reunite these artifacts by 3D printing them and, and bringing them back to the village. So it never is good as the real McCoy, but having a facsimile that you don't have to worry about if it breaks, we can just print another one. If it gets stolen, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, it's just a really neat project, and I thought a, a good use of, of uh, 3D printing technology. So the next bit of the talk, I'm going to delve into uh, drones and, and larger scale mapping. So <clears throat> this little drone is a drone. Uh, it's a DJI Mavic. Pro 2, I think. Um, there's been more recent drones since this one. But this is a drone that you can go on Amazon, you can go to Best Buy, uh, retail store, and purchase, and it will do amazing mapping of entire archaeological landscapes. You can, you can cover many square miles with this little, little guy uh, doing uh, photogrammetry. So this is me mapping a site in the Kimberley in, in Northern uh, Australia. But things a little closer to home, uh, drones can take amazing photographs that we just can't 
you know, get from any other perspective very easily. Uh, this is a TP ring uh, from central Wyoming. Um, again, just you can get dramatic photos that help uh, demonstrate what's going on at a site. Uh, this is a site of Cochaski in uh, the highlands of, of Ecuador. So we're in the Andes here. These are mound sites. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go visit this site, it's uh, really amazing. It's open to the, the public monumental uh, level of landscape. And uh, while we're on Ecuador, I'll just kind of say one of the side things we've been doing there with drones is there's a, a type of archeological site there called a Pucara, which means fort in Quechua. And uh, these are, we believe that there's some controversy about that, but we believe these are Inca sites uh, that are scattered around and they're all in, well, most are in very remote areas at, at the tip top of the Andes. So they're really hard to get to. Um, you'll see some trails and things, but I, I promise you, these are not <laughs> easy to get around on. Um, in fact, many of them are just for animals and such. But um, if you get within a kilometer of one of these, you can fly the drone out and then uh, we're looking at shaded relief models that that allow us to see the details. So you can see the rings. Um, they are they're all made up of concentric rings with a kind of a fort in the in the middle. But that's one of the things we've been doing with with drones and uh, just kind of basic mapping in South America. There's another couple of examples. This one's got a pretty nice nice shapes on a on a ridge. Um, so it's not only, um, quadcopter style drones, like you're probably familiar with, um, that you see people flying at the park. Uh, we also use fixed wing drones. Um, they fly longer, so uh, they're more aerodynamic, so they're more efficient, uh, just like any, uh, airplane is versus a helicopter. So if you're mapping a site and you got to do a huge area, sometimes using a uh, airplane style is, is the way to go. Um, for all of these, we're, we're talking about doing photogrammetry. So just like I was saying, overlapping photos, uh, you to program a mission, we draw a polygon over the area we want to fly. And then the computer figures out where it's supposed to go and then it will take, uh, you'll throw it up in the air, it'll take thousands of photographs that overlap, and then you're able to create a 3D model from that. Um, <clears throat> it's worth pointing out that photogrammetry cannot see through vegetation. So if, if there's something in the way, if there's a canopy you know, from vegetation or a building or something, it, photogrammetry is only as good as your camera. It can't, can't see through it. Um, that said, <clears throat> here's several square kilometers of agricultural land uh, near uh, Banana Creek in, um, in central Belize. And uh, the area where my cursor is, I hope you can see that, is uh, agricultural fields. So the Mennonites here, they grow corn, I think a little bit of soybean, uh, maybe a couple of other crops. And while we were here working, uh, they had just cleared these fields. They just just gone fallow. And so on the left is kind of a, is an aerial view of this gigantic area. Uh, these are roads that you see. This is a river, the Blaze River, if I remember correctly. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at the 3D model of that, if we look at the digital elevation model of what is below there, uh, and stripping away the texture, we can then see that we've got all of these mounds everywhere, these little pimple looking things. And these, these are all Maya structures. And these bigger ones, you can, you can see with your naked eye quite easily. They're, you know, these are pretty huge things. But if you look in the fields, there are dozens of little bitty blips here and there. And you cannot see those with your naked eye. And the only reason we can see them in the computer is because 
we can place a virtual uh, light source. So we can put a sun anywhere we want around this and illuminate and cast shadows from different uh, directions. And uh, this allowed us to see when we lined it up just perfectly that there are these mounds out here. And if you move the light around in a few directions, you, you realize there is uh, about, I think, 180 different mounds just in these two little, little fields. So very helpful for looking at landscape level archaeology. Uh, it doesn't always have to be on a drone. Um, here we have uh, a modified GoPro, very common camera, uh, attached to the wing of a, a manned aircraft. And we were doing some uh, mapping in the jungle. Uh, so Guatemala would be here on the far left. Again, this is in Belize. If you go to if if you want to go to a, a very uh, American friendly country, go to Belize. Uh, they speak English. They use the dollar. Very friendly uh, people. So it uh, you'll see a whole lot of archaeologists work in this this part of Mesoamerica just because of how easy it is to to do. Um, but we're looking at several square miles, uh, fifty square miles, if I remember correctly, in total. Uh, this is a village called Gallon Jug. There's an archaeological site down here called Chanchich. I won't, won't go into it really, other than to tell you that this is an area that we mapped just using a GoPro uh, and uh, a fixed wing aircraft that one of the Mennonite guys had. And I'll give you a little bit of a tease. Um, I have been working on a really cool project on a uh, White Sands Missile Range. So you, if you're into archaeology, and I'm sure most of you are, you'll get alerts uh, about you know, different sites and things will pop up in your news feed. And uh, over the past couple of years, there's been a, several news articles about these uh, uh, trackways, these animal and human footprints that track across this White Sands formation. Uh, part of the White Sands formation is in a national park, uh, which is a great visit if you haven't been there. It's a really amazing landscape. Um, but the majority of the landform uh, is on uh, a Department of Defense facility. And we are currently in the process of mapping the trackways that are on the missile range side of the park. So we're talking about mastodon, um, woolly mammoth, camel, giant sloth, uh, dire wolf, uh, all of these things, uh, and with strong suggestions of human footprints intermingled. Uh, we had we found one the other day that had a, uh, a mammoth footprint on top of a human footprint. You can see both of them superimposed. So pretty, pretty crazy uh, stuff. These are giant sloth footprints and they've been known for a while. And uh, you all being from the Northwest, you won't be surprised that uh, when these were first discovered, they were uh, thought to be Sasquatch. Um, the drone we're using for that work is uh, this guy here. Uh, it's what's called a blue drone. And it's uh, blue is a Department of Defense word for meaning really expensive. Uh, it's been, it, it's made of only parts from the United States. It has encryption, it has all these protections so that uh, no, no funny business happens with the drone essentially. But it basically takes a drone that would be a significantly less expensive, makes it much more expensive. This is a, give you an idea how big it is. So, um, the, down here, there's a full-size SLR camera that's on the bottom. Uh, and this is Mike Stowe. He's one of the archaeologists at, at White Sands Missile Range. And then I threw in one of the photos from the internet of some of the footprints from the National Park site so you guys could see that. So I can't tell you anything about it now because we're in the process, but it is really spectacular. And I, I think uh, you'll find it uh, really fascinating when that stuff does come out. See, how am I doing on time here? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there's two more things I'm going to talk about, and that's LIDAR and thermal. And we'll skip uh, through if I start getting a little too uh, 
behind on time. But um, LIDAR is a lot like the laser scanner that we talked about previously. Um, it's, it's often airborne in the way that archaeologists talk about it, but it can also be based off a boat or even stationary on the ground. And all it is is it's millions of pulses of laser per minute get shot to the ground while the aircraft is flying. And of those millions of pulses of, of lasers, most of them are going to land in the vegetation on top of uh, whatever they're flying above. So if you're in the desert, no, no vegetation, no big deal. But if you're flying over jungle or heavily vegetated places uh, like your neck of the woods, um, enough of those lasers will will make it to the ground because there's just so many of them and bounce back that you'll get a signal for, for the vegetation and then a lower number of symbol, uh, signals from the earth below. <clears throat> um, so where this has changed a lot here recently is uh, airplane-based LIDAR, which is still very useful because it can cover gargantuan areas. Um, but it takes a, an aircraft that's dedicated to that sort of work. You have to pay for the fuel. You have normally at least a pilot and a co-pilot and a technician running the LIDAR equipment. And then the, the LIDAR equipment can be, well, it's all in six figures, uh, upper six figures. And some of it can be in the millions of dollars. So you're talking about a pretty big investment. So what's happened very recently is the advent of drone-based LIDAR. So this is me on the left holding the controller. There's this thing on the tripod is a special GPS. And then this thing called the M300 is the, the drone. And then there's a, a LIDAR unit attached to the drone. In this instance, the uh, we took a boat with this equipment. And I mean a little boat up a big river um, and uh, then hiked up to this Maya site. The guys chopped me a hole in the vegetation so I could fly and, and take pictures. And this is just another view, a little more open area, but the area that I'd be mapping with the drone is this vegetated stuff that's in the distance. It has a controller that uh, can show you all sorts of neat information. Uh, it gives you a live feed looking straight down here on the left, which is what the, the LiDAR unit is, is seeing. And then as it's scanning, uh, it's this, area in blue on the right, this uh, the LIDAR scan gives you other information, like it's showing that I'm flying in too windy of conditions. And then there's a forward facing camera down here on the lower right that shows how much it's yawing because of the, the wind. So you get a lot of information while you're flying it. Uh, just like the other uh, stuff I mentioned, uh, it, these are robots. So we just draw a polygon around what we're interested in flying. It determines what, what it's going to do. You hit fly and you stand back and watch and wait. When the battery gets low, it comes back, it lands, you stick another battery in it and it goes and finishes its mission. Uh, so when I talk about flying these things, there's a little bit of manual flying, but for the most part, these are just robots out doing their thing. Um, So uh, this is the site of Altun Ha, which is a Maya site. This is open to see what the vegetation looks like. And uh, getting a warning here that I got unstable internet, so hopefully that won't last. Um, but <clears throat> this is what the LiDAR data looks like uh, from the side. Um, looking thing. Uh, these are vegetation. I think you can see some of the plants and such. But the important part for me as an archaeologist is this sloping ground here. So this is a, a mound that's under very dense vegetation. And here's another way to illustrate that data. Um, on top, this is the LIDAR data with all the vegetation. And uh, below it, you can see what happens when we look at only the signals from the bare earth model. And we can see that there's a, a beautiful uh, Maya site that's back there in the jungle.
So this is that site, Al Tun Ha. Again, the middle doesn't have any vegetation, but all these areas around uh, to the sides uh, are in jungle or very dense uh, vegetation. And uh, when you compare this to the map that the archaeologists have of the structures that they've drawn in, there's so much more here uh, that we see that, that just hasn't been documented yet. Okay, the very last thing, and I think I'll end up using just about right on my time, is um, this is kind of an accident that happened uh, with some data I recently collected. Um, and it's using a, a different kind of sensor, which is a thermal imaging sensor. And the, the thermal imaging sensor is designed to see heat. And so it, it tells you the very precise temperature of things. Uh, it's typically used in like roof inspections. Uh, so people use them to see if their house has an insulation problem where they might be losing heat. Um, a lot of people uh, use them for hunting wild hogs at night uh, when they're active. Um, so they can find the heat signature of the animal and, and, and track it down. But I bought it for something, you know, that doesn't involve killing animals. <laughs> and um, that was for karst mapping. So uh, as many of you will probably know, um, if you go underground a, a, a foot or two, it, it varies depending on what area of the world you're in and the conditions, but there's a constant temperature uh, for the earth in a given area. Uh, around this particular site that we're looking down on is um, about 71 degrees. And when you have karst features, meaning caves and sinkholes and things, uh, they will often breathe out the air inside of them, which is that 71 degrees into the ambient air that's outside. So this is probably kind of a weird image to look at if you're not used to looking at them, but this long blue thing on the north side is a river. And then the rest of it is uh, mostly just limestone. So, uh, but the main point is, is I was able to pinpoint uh, where possible locations for caves were based on the temperature of the signal that was coming out. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just briefly just mention that uh, thermal imaging, you have to take thousands of photos. It, it, it's very low resolution. So you have to take a lot of photos to get any good data out of it. Uh, you got to fly close to the ground. It's very time consuming. It's very complicated to process. But where I'm going with all this <clears throat> is um, I was working uh, in uh, South Central New Mexico and uh, New Mexico State University was doing an ex excavation at a site called Cottonwood Springs. And this is prehistoric architecture we're looking down upon. I think you guys can probably recognize that. And these are the students uh, doing their, their work. Uh, I was just uh, in the area, we knew each other, and uh, Bill Walker asked if, if I would do some drone photos uh, so he could get some documentation. So one thing I forgot to mention is the, the thermal camera also takes regular color images at the same time it takes the thermal images. So I had the, <clears throat> this, sorry, I had this drone with me, so, I thought, well, I'll take it out and I'll get some just true color images like we're looking at now of the site. And it's a beautiful site, really photogenic as far as archaeology goes. Um, but I started to wonder, I'm collecting this thermal data. I, I wonder what, if there's anything that might show up. And uh, this is looking down on their excavation. So this is the true color on the left, obviously, and the thermal on the right. It's no surprise that we can see the walls in the thermal data because you can see them with your, your naked eye there on the left. But I flew it out over just open desert. And if you look on the right-hand side here, there are room blocks scattered in here that you can't see on this left-hand side. And here are more. So down here, there's a long linear line here of structure in here that probably come through the dunes and match up here. Uh, here's a, another example 
although I think this might be, I might have shown that one. But um, here's a, a yet another example. This is uh, myself here and Tim Graves, a local archaeologist. And we're out ground truthing these spots because I couldn't believe that <clears throat> the thermal data was showing us things that we couldn't see with our naked eye. And uh, as the, the final slide here, um, this is a composite map showing just some of the walls we were able to identify highlighted in red. It turns out we were parking on and driving across room blocks that we couldn't see um, that uh, is no longer doing that. And um, I'll be going back to this site and doing uh, much more of this thermal mapping uh, LIDAR and then ground penetrating radar and some other uh, technologies we're going to uh, throw at it to see what we can find out. But I really appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any any questions and thank you very much. Hey, thanks oh, a minute, good. Mark. <laughs> that was really good. Uh, we, we've got a number of questions that came in on the Zoom, and we've got some questions here from the audience. So we'll take first question from the audience. Good lecture. Uh, I've got several questions. What kind of lenses are you, are you recommend you, uh, for that uh, for that photo photography for three D? And are color filters useful? And also, can you impose a a grid system on your 3D model, or uh, maybe uh, would a a, um, a photo scale on the photograph be useful to uh, measure all the uh, dimensions in a, a 3D model in a photograph? Yes. So uh, on the lenses, um, that just like any photography can vary quite a bit, but for the most part, a wide angle is really good. Uh, I use a 20 millimeter. And the reason it can be good, especially with rock art, is you can get normally within about uh, by, well, nine or so inches of the subject matter and still get a photo that's uh, sharp. So <clears throat> that's the lens I use most of the time. But there are times I use a macro or I use a 50 millimeter, just kind of depends. But uh, I try to use a prime uh, 20 millimeter. Um, as far as scale goes, <clears throat> I, I didn't go into that, but uh, I will lay down a scale in in my images, and I'm able to then extrapolate in the software the scale of, of the artifact or the rock art panel that I'm doing. And uh, yes, you can project a grid uh, right back on top of, of uh, the 3D models. Yeah, you can do that most easily in a GIS software, but there, there are a couple of different ways to do it. Was that all of your questions? Yeah. Filters. Oh, and filters. filters. Oh. Um, one, one more about filters, Mark. Yes. Um, I have not found that the color filters uh, make that much of a difference, but that doesn't mean it's not worth experimenting uh, more. I, I find that I keep circling back to different things that I've tried in the past and, and, and depending on the site and, uh, just the changes in technology. Sometimes you'll you'll find some something does work, but I haven't in the, in this case. Okay, thank you, Mark. We got a question coming off the uh, Zoom here. Here's Julia. So someone in the chat asks, uh, UAS Mapper MetaShape user here. Do models of small scale three D objects require control points to aid with image alignment? Yes, uh, that can be pretty complicated, um, and would probably need its own uh, own talk altogether. So there's, um, if if they'll shoot me an email, I can uh, walk them through some, some ways to get in and around that. But essentially you can add what are called control points um, manually, which can help the models uh, come together. And you, uh, especially when you're doing small objects, sometimes you have to do control points to, to get the, the objects to come together. But I have many tricks about that, but they're very, very technical. Um, and if you're a MetaShape user, I, I could probably talk to you offline better about it. Okay, so uh, Mark, this uh, 
feller doesn't give his email here, where can he get your email? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was on the screen. It's uh Ah, there it is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's too big for me to see it. <laughs> we got another question too. Same person asks, have you experimented with multispectral sensors and SFM to help accentuate features? Thank you. Yes, uh, I did not include any slides on that, but uh, I have been. And uh, in fact, I'm using that on some of the white sands work that, that I, I mentioned. Uh, for the most part, I'm doing it on landscape level sites and uh, use, using NDVI and some very specific um, multispectral sensors. For the most part, I haven't had any luck with them, but uh, if you are any luck finding archaeology, I couldn't see with my naked eye, but it does sometimes enhance things you can see and bring out some, some details. My question. <laughs> So I just have a random question, which is, have you ever tried using Blender with any of this stuff on Mesh Lab, like the freeware stuff? Yes, um, I use Blender. Uh, I use Mesh Lab. Those are both great, great softwares. Uh, I'm, I helped develop what became this type of photogrammetry uh, back in 2007, 2008. And uh, we distributed it, it all as open source so that uh people and companies could make better versions of what we put together. So Blender, which is open source, is, a, you know, I'm a fan of that. But I, I use some pay software as well, just because I've used it for years. But, yep, I'm a fan of Blender and, and uh, Mesh Lab. Are there other questions from the audience here? Hey, Mark, it doesn't look like we have any more here. Whoa, there, somebody raised their hand and I didn't see it. In the moment, do you know? <laughs> You showed several views of, I think it was Inca archaeology way up on top of the mountains. And then you shortly after that said something about it not seen through the vegetation. Were those bare sites up there or was that a different technology? Um, I, the main reason I mentioned that, you, that it wasn't seen through the uh, vegetation was because I was going to show you the, the LIDAR, which could. Um, in the Instances of, of those forts, they're in what's called the Paramo, which is this very dense grassland that uh, exists. I can't remember if it's like 9,000 or 10,000 feet. It's way, way up there that it happens and where most things can't grow. Uh, but there's this uh, dense grass that grows. And so <clears throat> you're seeing in those images, you're actually seeing a 3D model of the grass that's growing on top of the, the archaeology, uh, and it only shows up because they're they're so monumental and so gigantic that you can see them in the grass. If that makes sense. Okay. Other questions? There being none, Mark, I want to say thank you. Very interesting lecture. Enjoyed it. Uh, I have one just a request, sort of. Can you the the stuff you sent me on the Signal Mountain site, the uh, the uh, the images of the of the panels. Can you send me the versions with the texture taken off so I just see the gray stuff too? Oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And uh, it's time for everybody to uh, get together and go home. Thank you.